The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room that's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought-after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign-on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks, and welcome to another edition of The Engine Room. I'm coming here from downtown Tamworth, we're looking out over the uh, the edge of the northwest slopes and plains and the beginning of the New England uh, area, and I'm with Brett Taggart, who is the managing partner of Bell Partners Australia. G'day, Brett. How are you? Andrew, beautiful. Thank you, mate. Welcome to Tamworth. I know you you grew up around here, so I hope you uh, you enjoy being back in God's country. Yeah. So um, it's, I think everyone's passionate about where they're from, but I do like the fact that. Uh, I don't think you get closer to stars than you do in the northwest um, of, of of New South Wales. So, um, coming living in the city most of my life these days, um, looking up at night's always a bit of a treat when you come out this far. That's big sky out here, buddy. There's there's plenty of space, beautiful clean air, um, peace and quiet. It's a great place to live. Good place to bring up kids uh, and and grow a family. And and Kieran, the sound guy, if you want to put links to the Tamworth Tourism Board, uh, uh, Brett Brett's clearly on the board, so we'll probably get. A bit of that, but um, look, I was pretty. You know, we, we go back a long way, and um, I think our, our first interaction was probably over a, a, a six pack of VB or something like that at uh, Newcastle University. But um, Brett, what, what um, you know, maybe give us an overview of what your role is right now today, and then let's let's rewind it and figure out um, you know how you've got to uh, be be running a, a business Australia wide. I'm in your Tamworth office. It appears that it's a big office. You've Looks like you've got about 15, 20 people running around here, which is a, a big, big show for, for a regional practice. But um, yeah, mate, what, where, where are you now and what did you, uh, how did you kick off? Yeah, good question. So where I am today is, uh, is a lot different to, to where I did kick off pretty well 30 years ago. Uh, today, as I always have, is, is sitting at the, the top of the Bell Partners Wealth Creation brand. So that was a joint venture between my business partner, Anthony Bell, and myself to bring financial planning into the broader accounting firm uh, 20 years ago, uh, and it started out with basically myself and and, and him, uh, and today there's six offices, there's close to 30-plus people all up and down the eastern seaboard. Where, where are your offices, Brett? Uh, so we've got offices in Brisbane, Port Macquarie, Tamworth, Newcastle, uh, Sydney. Uh, there's one in Canberra, uh, small presence in, in Melbourne, so... Anywhere in the eastern seaboard in New South Wales and southeast Queensland, you'll get access to one of our guys. But it wasn't always like that, was it? So um, maybe give us a bit, a bit of a feel for um, how you came to uh, get into financial planning. Yeah, as you said, mate, we go back a long way. Uh, first year university, 1992 in, in Newcastle, which- We met in the library, would that be right? Uh, I think so, or well, lectures and tutes doing economics. Uh the first year I did really, really well at social, not so much at study. And when I came home first semester, my dad wasn't that happy that I had two P's and two F's in my academic transcript. I had no idea what I was doing anyway. Well, FP, mate, financial planning, maybe it was in the water. I added around, yeah. And one of our guys goes, Brett, P's get degrees. So I'm glad I followed that philosophy. And that was my mission always to the end as, as I just wanted to get the university part out of the way so I could get into into the workforce, earning some money and, and applying some skill to what I was interested in, which was 
uh, finance and banking and wealth and money and those sorts of things, um, which you didn't really get access to. You know, when we were growing up, there was no internet. You know, this will sound bizarre for people, no internet, no emails, it was all faxes and phones and those sorts of things, and you had to read it in a book. So, you know, going through a degree in economics, uh, you, you gathered some skills and I wanted to put those into play. Then I started out. When I left university, it was in 1994, uh, and that was a tough time in markets. It was a bond market crash, and there were no jobs, uh, particularly not in Newcastle. So I had to go to Sydney for a stint. Uh, I did half a day at a place that you knew very well, very well, a place called Saxby Bridge. That wasn't my cup of tea, and I was lucky enough to know people who knew people who got me into a financial planning practice up in Newcastle called LOFP. Uh, and the financial planner there was a fellow called Rick McCosker, and Rick played cricket for Australia. He's a, he's famously the one who had his he got hit face, in the head, he, yeah, yeah, he got hit in the head, yeah, and then played on and played on. He came out oh. with his with his head bandaged in the uh, centenary test, and Rick was a financial planner. Uh, and through connections through a guy called Damien Crowley from uh, Perpetual, he said, "Brett, I know a guy. I'll see if I can get you a, a spot there." I met. Paul Mandelidis, who, who was the manager for National Mutual Financial Planning in Sydney, he said, Brett, I don't have a job here, but I'll see what I can do for you. It got me basically an internship back in Newcastle where my now wife, she was still going to university. So that was great. I got, got to go back to, to Newcastle. And for three to six months, I worked for free in, in Rick's office, learning the intricacies of power planning and financial planning. It's like an old school PY. It was, mate. And and I would I would have done anything and did do anything to have the opportunity to get into the industry. Uh, so it was no problem for me to to do those few months without pay. Uh, and when I got to the end of the, that, that period, they said, look, mate, we'll give you a job here. We'll pay you, which I just thought was, was magic. I, I actually could earn money without having to, you know, with huge amounts of physical exertion because growing up here, uh, my family's all Tradies. So. That's right. So from from memory, your dad was a, a builder. It might have been a bricklayer. How's my yeah, memory? Correct. You're spot on. Yeah, still is a bricklayer. Yeah. Wow. And so when yes. you when you brought two fails home in first year, he looked at you and he's gone, mate. These these it's it's either it's it's get busy or or, or you're, you're pushing the barrow real quick. Absolutely. And I think looking back now, or well, if I look back now at, at what was going on, that was his way of saying, yeah, it's probably don't waste the opportunity you've been given here. Uh, and not that there's to say that. Uh, I couldn't come back and do whatever I wanted. I could. That, is, that was his way of saying, mate, have a have a proper go here. So, um, yeah, I would have done anything to get a to get a start, which I did. So I was really grateful for the fact that I could I could work with Rick, get paid to do something I really love to do, and and learn about the industry and learn about the trade. It was an awesome awesome upbringing. And you, um, so that was uh, about ninety six, ninety seven, mm. and um, you, you'd pretty finished a, a degree in economics. Had you started the what was the DFP? Um, at that stage, is that right? No. So, uh, actually, yes, I did. I, I had started the the first of the eight units while I was with, uh, with Rick. So, not long after I started to be able to get your um, authorised representative certificate, I was licensed through National Mutual Financial Planning, which doesn't exist today, which became Charter Financial Planning or AMP Financial Planning. Uh, they ran internal courses. So, you do – I think we went to Canberra for – three or four days and they did an AR course. Uh, plus you studied while you were at work to get your certificate to be able to give advice uh, and then at the same time enrolled through Deakin University to do my DFP, uh, which uh, I do remember, yes, I had to because I had to pay for it. Yep. Uh, and money wasn't abundant, but it was a requirement to work in the industry that you needed you needed your DFP. So I just had to beg, borrow and steal to pay the 800 bucks to do my first enrollment, DFP1. Uh, and again, like university, I just wanted to get it out of the way. So I worked and studied and got my DFP out of the way. Uh, and the qualifications for CFP were a little different back then. And as soon as DFP finished, jumped in and did my uh, CFP status yep. as well, which yep. finished with an, an SOA and an exam and, and off you go. So I, I had my CFP by the time 1998 rolled around. Yeah, I think um, I think I got mine about 2001. And I think, um, uh, although um, uh, we look back now and the requirements weren't, weren't tremendous from what it was, Oh. Uh, the DFP8, um, uh, for everyone who's uh, been in the business for, for many years, um, introduced us to the concept of basically a statement of advice, full planning. It Correct. was actually, which I actually really liked. I mean, these days um, they may be overboard with you know continuous disclosures and whatnot, but the full plan made you feel good, I reckon. Uh, absolutely. It gave you a, a sense of holistic planning. You know, there was estate planning, uh, personal insurance, but you know comments on general insurance, health insurance, uh, Portfolio construction, cash flow, 
goals-based planning. It was all inco- all encapsulated in 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 those documents, and obviously access to to early on software with FPI, Busy Plan. Uh, they were starting to 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 come to the market and expand their capabilities in what they could do, uh, and you got to use all of those various tech stacks to to produce a full financial plan, which you know. In, we're, we're very comprehensive, but obviously not as uh, huge in volume as they are That's perhaps right. today. That's right. And they cut to the heart of the issue straight away as well for people. So yeah. Very similar recommendations to what people do today. Just Absolutely. Without the, the duplicate. Absolutely. So, so um, you then made your way uh, down to Sydney. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I'm sitting here in Tamworth and um, you've, you've cut a really lovely life here with your, your kids and, 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 and your wife you met at university. Um, but you're moving further away from from Tamworth. What made you go to Sydney, and and where did you where, where were you working? Oh yeah. Um, so going back when we started, uh, the move to Sydney is probably not one that I would have made consciously. Uh, leaving Newcastle or being in Newcastle when my wife finished university, she couldn't get a job uh, in her chosen field that she she studied for, uh, and her first job was in Sydney. So it was by necessity that we had to go 150 k's down the road to. To find work, that's just the way it was, and I was fortunate enough through the National Mutual Financial Planning Network that I could go to work for National Mutual Financial Planning in the city in their state office in the New South Wales office as a para planner. So you know, I had a panel of sixty or seventy planners that I was their dedicated para planning service for. It was so within charter, is that right? It was was National Mutual Financial Planning, and I remember sitting in a boardroom where uh, Paul. Uh, another fellow, Graham Roberts, uh, and a guy called Mark Burrell, who was the CEO of the licensees, came from Melbourne and had a few of us in the office and said, we're launching a new brand. Uh, sometimes National Mutual doesn't resonate that well within the market, so we want to bring a brand that's non-NMFP recognized. And they gave us a list, list of names, and one of them was Charter Financial Planning. And not that I take credit or we take credit for, for naming it. They'd already done it. They just wanted to test case it. So we got to see what was about to happen, and that was Charter Financial Planning. Uh, the genesis of charter financial planning then. Once I'd done my 12 months, again, I just wanted to get out into business and try and earn some money. And I did a uh, um, business partnership with a fellow called David Brown, which is Stanford Brown. Uh, it was Brown Bully back then. David was was probably my first mentor in business. I knew nothing. I had no background. I, coming from trades background, my uncles, my cousins, my dad, they were all self-employed, but they were tradesmen first and business people long after that. So I understood the concepts of being self-employed, controlling your own destiny, but knew nothing about business. And I knew nothing about financial planning business. Uh, and um, I got to go to work with David in partnership with his big insurance-based business back then in Neutral Bay. Because I think he had, did he have a lot of corporate superannuation oh, there was businesses? Corporate, yeah. corporate superannuation, individual insurance, the old retirement products. Yeah. Lump sum retirement. What year was that, Brett? That was 1997. It's interesting because um, you know we're, we're now um, many many years on and, and Stanford Brown's gone from strength to strength and Bell Partners financial plan didn't even exist and now you're a significant business so I suppose congratulations to both of you shout out if you're listening Dave yeah uh, look um, he showed me a lot about business and and financial services but he also showed me uh, the skill set required in this industry to be able to win uh, that the small things count that appearance and and um, how you present yourself matter. Uh, you know, small, just the small details. That, one percent. The one percent is things like you know, it, it sounds simple. But, you know, coming from coming from a background where you didn't get exposure to any of this, uh, it was it was job sites and swearing and hard work. So I had no concept of shining shoes, washing a car, keeping your clothes presentable, uh, and how you appeared in public outside of work mattered as well. So he taught me all the little one percenters: personal appearance, grooming. Language, writing, writing skills, presentation skills, how your documents are put together, all these things mattered and counted because back then too, it was a hyper competitive environment. Banks yeah. were just starting to come into financial planning and you know we were pitching a lot and plan fees didn't really exist either. The concept of charging for your work was foreign to a lot of people. In fact, I remember some people's value proposition was we don't charge for advice. That's how they were winning business and they could do that because it was called a nil entry fee product, which yeah. were awesome. Uh, but that was starting to transition and change too. So you had to stand on your own two feet. And we were pitching hard because you're up against CBA, NM, you know, NAB, 
ANZ, they're all starting to come. And to this the is the early noughties, wasn't it? Oh, absolutely. Late late nineties, early nineties. Yeah. And, and and it was a tough, hard, competitive environment. And he showed me that to be able to win deals and win the little things count. You had to be able to find ways that you could compete against these guys. Because you remember, we were a small business. We had nowhere near the resource that CBA or NAB or any of those guys had, or the big accounting firms or the big stockbrokers. We had none of their research, none of their resource. You had your rat cunning and you had your wit and you had your skill set and you had your values. Get a link to the rat cunning website, please, Kieran. Yeah. Um, that's uh, that's, <laughs> that's going to be there. Yeah. And and um, so the uh, AFSLs, as we know them now, came in in 2003. Yeah. And maybe give me a, a bit of a feel of how, uh, you know, you, you, you kicked off in the bell business, which has been, you know, your baby now for almost 20 years. Yeah. Uh, so- one thing I'd learned working in that self-employed environment and pitching hard, one of the first things clients would say is, I want to show my accountant what you've put to me. And invariably, the accountants would go, oh, don't pay him that. He's a national mutual representative. He's just going to sell you national mutual products, which wasn't true. I'll do it for you. And the licensing regime was not very strict. So you know, a lot of the accountants, and no disrespect, they, they didn't have to – they had an exemption. They didn't need licensing. There was actually an accountant's exemption. They didn't need to be licensed. So uh, they'd just go, well, I'll do it. Yeah, there were Bleakleys and Count, and these guys were licensing them, and and we'd miss out on the deals a lot. So I thought, this is no good. How am I going to get around this? If I can't beat them, I've got to join them. So I made it my business to understand accountants and to work closely with accountants to generate referral sources. And a client of mine that I grew up with here in Tamworth, a guy called Shannon Whitney, who runs one of the best real estate businesses in Sydney, called Bressick Whitney, uh, kept going on about his accountant who was who was Aunt Anthony Bell, and he said, "Guys, you got to meet." So I did. And Ant and I struck up a relationship and he rang one day and he said, Brett, look, we refer all our work out at the moment to a particular firm uh, and they're a little bit tricky for us. I think there's an opportunity. We can do this in-house and do it really, really well. Would you like to do that? And What I, year was that? That was in 2001. Yep. Um, and I said, absolutely, mate. I think you're, you're absolutely spot on. Uh, and we took the business in-house to provide financial planning to, to Bell Partners clients. It was done as a joint venture with an external company I was a part of to start with. And then over time, we just worked out that not having a Bell Partners name wasn't helping us. So we had to find a way to make it a Bell Partners branded name. And we called it Bell Partners Wealth Creation. And we did that in 2000 and, uh, 2003. And we we're still licensed through Charter Financial Planning back then. Uh, but again, I could see some of the issues back then. It was very different being owned by a life office, being owned by National Mutual still, or, or AXA as it was was causing some grief and be, accountants being fiercely independent, we had to go down that path. So in 2005, we applied for our own AFSL and, and have run our own license. And you've been the RM ever since? RM director, yeah, yeah. ever since. Yeah. And look, um, I'm going to ask you some some questions, personal questions. We'll come back to, to the business. So then you you then uh, spent, uh, a lot of people know Bell Partners from the sailing community. It uh, was uh, very well recognized. I think once you did a Hobart, once or twice. Mm. Two times, yep, and a uh, big, big, lovely office there down in, in Darling Harbour. But um, you've made your way back uh, to Tamworth, um, and uh, you, because you've got, I think you've got three, three kids, two, two kids, two kids. So for one more, so we, I, I did pass one that looked a bit like you. Yeah, straight there, if you stood down, so, um, But you've got a couple of kids, and what made the decision? Because you had a great business, you lived in from memory, you live up the North Shore there, sure. and, and you decided to. To come back and craft uh, this entire business um, from scratch up here. Yeah. Look, it wasn't by, by intention. So here, you know, having 20-something years in Sydney was great uh, with a growing family that I progressively saw less of as business grows. And, and you told me early on, every child you have, you move 10 kilometers further out from, from the city. That's it. Uh, so, you know, I ended up in- French's Forest or something. Forest. Yeah, 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 yeah. So two kids <laughs> equals 15 k's out. Uh, and when we moved there, I, I could get into the city in half an hour. But by the end, 12 years later, oh no, sorry, six or seven years later, it was taking close to an hour. So that's each way. So there's two hours, that's 10 hours a week that I'm not spending with my family who are growing rapidly, yep. going through school, missing out on opportunities. And these are things that you do to, to, to make the sacrifices for the betterment of your family. But it was getting to the point, you go, well, what's all this for? Aging parents, uh, all our families here, we didn't really have any family connection to, to Sydney and I just said one day to, to, to my wife, I go, I, I, I can't live here anymore. Um, and I think at the time, we were just knocking on the door. This is like seven years ago? This was 2018. Yeah. So 
uh, Skype was in, Zoom probably not as much. It, it, we kind of, we, it was possible to start doing remote work. Obviously, post-COVID, it sounds silly that you'd even contemplate it. But um, And, you know, we chatted uh, the, uh, yesterday or um, the other day and you said COVID was the best thing that happened to, to regional regional oh, practices. Huge. Um, so you, you came back and you just uh, kicked off and fundamentally you were you were commuting to to Sydney via uh, on the plane a couple of days. That's it. A couple of days a week, I'd go down and um, COVID happened and shut everything down for for two years, which for me was was awesome. You know, everybody had to create and adapt to to be able to get done what they needed to do from where they were, uh, and and there was no other option. So you were forced to adapt and. We we're blessed with tools like Zoom, like Skype, you know, like Teams, and everybody had to adapt. So what we do now was unthinkable six or seven years ago, but today it's just it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It's just common practice that we get things done from where we are. Um, so when I came back, there was no real intention to be able to set up a business here. But what I'd realised through observation, lots and lots of people ask me, ask me for help. Coming back, my family said, "Hey, can you help me with my financials?" planning and my wealth creation and friends and they're all reaching out saying can you help Brent? given that you're here you're local you're yeah, you, yeah. they feel like they're getting a uh, someone who's pretty pretty well uh, um, established and equated in yeah. Sydney and they, they're getting a, a top-notch person around the corner that's precisely so what I'd realized very quickly was accessibility was an issue for people in regions being able to get access to, to expertise quickly and easily was not as prevalent as it possibly could have been. Uh, knowledge and just joining the dots, uh, the same thing kept repeating itself over and over and over and over and over again. Uh, and the way the universe works, it always lands you where you need to be. A fellow here called Jock Steer, who's a, who's a great fellow that I'd known for many, many years from National Mutual Financial Planning Days, uh, had a business that he was selling. And I said, mate, look, I'm not going to buy, we won't buy the whole lot, but we'll buy half uh, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll put our name on it will bring the Bell Partners brand to Tamworth because I think there's opportunities for what I've learned after the last 25 years to do similar things here in Tamworth. And I think it will resonate simply because people are in the region doesn't mean they, they aren't valuing urgency, they're not valuing immediacy, they're not valuing expertise. Um, and I think we can do things differently here. We can we can bring a different slant to the way things are traditionally done in the region and see how we go. So we bought the Bell Partners IP to Tamworth and that's what you see today. You know, there's close to 17 people running around here. In we started that. I should, What's 17 more jobs that didn't exist well, before this, you came back? That's, that this is precisely it. So we shook hands with Jock in May 2020, in the middle of the COVID pandemic. Uh, we started operations in his office, uh, and then by the end of that year, we we were running out of room, uh, and the trajectory of where we were heading meant we had to find new premises and. I said to him, I said, we need this thing to look like we want it to, you know, we've got to build it now, but it's being built for the next five or 10 years. So finding an office, getting it fit out, and everyone will say you can't find people in, in regions, you know, you need staff, you need good people. And it's a common thing you hear in the regions, I can't find staff, I can't find good people. Well, COVID was another, you know, blessing for that, people moving out of the city. Uh, but I just said to him, you know, We've got to put ads up. We've got to be recruiting. You've got to be out there in the community finding those people. We've got something that I believe people will want to come and join. Well, it's a, it's a, if the scenario is the, the great arbitrage. It's you can have uh, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Perth style wages in an, in an environment where a very, very, very nice house is just over a million dollars. That's exactly, and this is the proposition. It's you and I didn't get the opportunity to do this when we were growing up. You mentioned off air that if you'd graduated unit, well, you'd left school. You're not required to go away to do university these days. You can do it online and the opportunity to join a professional firm and make metropolitan wages in a rural centre is here. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of, I mean, I think just regions come to hand like, um, uh, you know, Toowoomba, uh, Dubbo, um, even Arbidale's got a big practice on it really well. Um, obviously, Tamworth, Wagga, they're, they're, they're Griffith, there's lots of, just yes, there's just New South Wales and yeah. Um, Victoria and Queensland and and, um, and the other states have have them as well. So um, you've uh, you've managed to get those two hours back um, from moving to Tamworth. What, what what do you do outside of outside of uh, work to to keep yourself? Uh, I suppose to to detach from the the stresses of running quite a big business. Yeah, that's a good question, buddy. I think a lot of sorry, sorry. Just before I do that, you, you 
going for the Canberra Raiders adds to your stress. Uh, so that can't be that can't be uh, part of your answer. Absolutely, and a New South Welshman too for so long. This year was a great a great outcome. I think a lot of people, a lot of hit listeners might resonate with this. When when you're the uh, the owner, an equity owner, you know, a business owner, you, you never have an off switch. This is twenty four hour, twenty four seven, three sixty five, constantly thinking about the business. On, on all aspects, you know, you're working on the business, you'll be working in the business, you're an HR person, you're a people and culture person, you're a financial manager, you're everything. So to say that, you know, it's a traditional 8.30 to 5.30 business day doesn't really exist. It doesn't compute for me because uh, I, I, I'm always I'm always on. That doesn't mean that I'm structured with a, you know, every day is 8.30 to 5.30, you know, I could be in Sydney, I could be in Brisbane, I could be here. As long as I've got access to Wi-Fi and a computer, you can be anywhere else in the world you want to. How good's Wi-Fi? Oh, it's Thank so you, good. Thank you, CSIRO, oh, for inventing that. <laughs> it is so good. So, you know, our, our credo is, you know, we get the job done. However, wherever, it doesn't really matter. Um, and we look after our mates. We look after our clients. We look after the people we, we, we have working with us. And when we aim to have fun every day, that's our, that's our mission statement. So being here, I know that, I can be in an office within literally two minutes. You know, I made that choice con- consciously to say, well, I've, I know what it's like to travel an hour every day. I don't want to do that in- anymore. I'll do the opposite and I'll move closer and I'm two minutes away. Um, and, you know, being in this area, it's not too far to disconnect from other human beings. If you go, right, I need to decompress and, and just to have some space, a 15 minute drive, you're in the middle of nowhere and, you're in the beautiful countryside and, and you can breathe and say, right, well, I can I can re engage back into this where sometimes in the city, particularly in the in the big big cities, it's on twenty four C if you're in the city, it's very hard to find places. I was actually at an office the other day. We had an innovation day uh, at one of the big platforms who kindly hosted us and we had it at their office and walking around going to the bathroom, I noticed they had a room, a silence room for prayer or for silence for people who don't deal well with overstimulation or loud noise or I'd never seen that but like for me that would have been good 20 years ago I said you know it would have been good I did see it in another office but everyone here was in there having a dart that was a smoking room um so I go, what goes in there and the door opened all this smoke came out I go well that's pretty innovative you don't have to go outside they just made a room and you could you could dart on in the in the smoking room well these guys had something that you know obviously different religious backgrounds yeah and, and different um, upbringings, people need quiet time. Well, for me, being in nature or having the ability to to disengage from other human beings is an important aspect of, of life and being here allows me to do that. And the reason it's important for me, it, it provides clarity of thought. And and on that, um, first of all, thank you um, for, for sharing that. Um, and there's probably people who are going, that makes a lot of sense, um, especially if – you feel a bit out of fish, out of water in what you're doing every day, whether it be in the big city or whatnot. So maybe just change gears a bit to talk about the the organisational structure. If I could just get a bit of a feel for um, the Bell business itself is a diversified financial services group. If you can maybe just outline uh, the organisational structure and then drill down on on the bit that, that, that that's your baby, which is the financial services thing. Sure. Uh so as a service offering, an integrated service offering, there's obviously accounting, which was the the genesis of the business. Uh, then came financial planning and wealth creation. Uh, there's finance, general insurance, and legal. So and if effectively in the way it's been built is that um, other than banking checks, cashing and depositing checks, and that's old vernacular, I know, we can do anything that anybody else can do. And typically, do, you, do your clients uh, go across a lot of those disciplines? They do. And this is where it was tested in the city because Sydney's so big and distance is, is difficult and it takes a long time to get anywhere. We work in a currency of time. If we can put time back into people's lives by solving as many problems as we can, we're obviously going to create a better connection with our client and we're going to be able to have them be raving fans for us and, and tell other people about it. That that's that's the real, you know, big part of a value proposition. So if we could solve as many problems as we could by someone making one visit into the city, their wills, their estate planning, their insurances, their finance, their wealth, their accounting, all in one fell swoop. So they come in for two hours, have three or four meetings, everything's done. 
strict set of actions. They walk out, they go back home, they don't have to think about it as opposed to, I'll come into the city for the day, I'll go and see Brett, then I'll go and see my accountant, then I'll go and see my lawyer and I have five or six trips or four or five trips around the city. A whole day's gone. So we we aim to be able to solve as many of those as we possibly can. And I think the, you know, from the outside looking in, um, uh, although you had uh, the group had lots of clients, um, you did have um, certain clients that were very, very time poor, whether they be in, in media or in other sort of niche things, and they probably would have appreciated being able to just go to the one place and get it done. Absolutely. And the, the thing I've noticed is that human beings are, are pretty pretty predictable creatures. You know, if it applied to those guys, it's going to apply to a lot of other people. And bringing the business back here, I did say that to Jock. I said, look, if we put as many of these services in under the one umbrella, it, the same thing applies here because you what we've also got to remember these big regional hubs you talk about Orange, Bathurst, Griffith, Wagga, Toowoomba, Tamworth, Dubbo, they, and Armadale, they service a big area. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of small communities don't get access to this. So they'll come to a place like Tamworth for their healthcare, for their professions. So I said, mate, people are coming here for multiple appointments. There's no reason we can't do the same thing here. So. And just strategically have put your office directly above a whole floor of healthcare professionals. Correct. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> and, um, and they do. So people will come to town. They'll, they'll make a day of it to see their accountant, their financial yeah. planner, their lawyer, and, and yeah. what have you. I said, so we're dealing in the same currency here as everybody else is. We're dealing in the currency of time. So if we can put time back into people's day and they come in for a meeting in the morning and they knock it over, they can go to down and do their shopping. You know, They might come to town once a month and buy their not just their essentials, but that that's where they'll do their some banking or, yeah. or, or their phones or those sorts of things. So we're putting time back in people's day and that's why it's resonated. And what, what really, type really of clients? Well. What type of clients do you guys uh, – because you've had the accounting. Yeah, I imagine sure. you're a lot of self-employed people, but but the Bell Group, what, what, what's a client look like? Look, um, as, a, as a Bell Group, a lot of small to medium-sized enterprises, yep. self-employed people. Is that because they come in via the accounting channel quite often first? Uh, yeah, there, there is that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh a lot of time poor people, media, sports, um, executives, uh, business owners, people with complex problems who need their time to focus on what it is they do best so that they're not caught up in the minutia of you know, certain types of issues that can distract them from their main game because their main game is uh, playing- Their A game, that's yeah, right. Their A game needs to be concentrated on. If, yeah. if, if they're distracted and they lose their A game- they lose the game and they, they, they stop earning. So yep. they know that. They recognize the, the power of having good people in their corner. So it applies in business, as it applies in sport, as it applies in entertainment. It doesn't matter. The same principles apply for high-achieving people and aspirational people. So when you look at the type of clients that we have, a lot of them are aspirational. That they, they want to win. They want to, they want to do better in, in multiple fields. Uh, but it turns out a lot of them are self-employed, small to medium-sized, large business owners, areas like hospitality, uh, media, sport, uh, medicine. There's a whole cross section. And yeah. We haven't specifically said let's focus on the medicos. Let- so it sounds like also um, you would cater to a lot of people who have self-made their money. They, 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 is that right? People who've made their money and people who want to make their money. So aspirational. Aspirational. Because, I mean, in Sydney, uh, uh, your office is is basically down on the the, the, the wharf there at Darling Harbour. Yeah. Quite an aspirational um, space. and. And as you intimated at the very beginning here, uh, the one percenters, you know, as I walk into this office in, in regional Tamworth, everyone's impeccably dressed, uh, I met, uh, you know, very well, very professionally. The office is very professional as well. You are what, you know, expectations are, you are what you walk past. So um, now when with the organisation or the engine of this business, um, how, many, how many rough family units for the financial planning business do you run? When you say family units? Or how many, how many uh, groups of clients? Oh, uh, uh, groups of clients across all the regions, there'd be over a thousand. Yep, groups so, of clients. A thousand clients. That, um, um, you know, they could be family structures, self managed super fund businesses. You're nodding, mate. Doesn't translate well. So you just, as you nod, just say yes. But yes. When we spoke about this, yes, <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, and uh, you've got how many? How many ARs uh, are looking after that? Those? There's 15 ARs. Yep. Uh, we've just started our office in Port Macquarie, uh, which again. Which we'll delve into a little while. Uh, what we do resonates with with people in the regions. So we've got a Port Macquarie office, uh, and, and we've got a cohort of young guys who are who are doing their trade to become ARs as well. So how many? How many you, uh, of those fifteen? Yeah. How many of them are uh, sub sort of four or five years in the business? Uh, one, three, three, three or four. So you feel confident, given the scale of your business, that you can you can sort of help 
them with the scaffolding that you you mentioned and intimated that you received through various things such as the, the brown and whatnot earlier. Yeah, absolutely. And this is the this is part of the proposition for those young guys. And they're they're regional. This is all the region. No, they're in the city and some in the regions. The the, the one that they they all excite me. They're all great young people. Awesome. Uh, females, males from different backgrounds. And the one thing that we say to these guys is what we bring to the table and our value proposition to you is one word, it's opportunity. We're going to give you the opportunity to make this whatever you want to make it, to earn whatever you want to earn. There are no limits, only the limits that they impose upon themselves. Uh, and we will give you everything that we've known, everything we've learned, all the hard knocks that we've taken to pass that over to you to shorten the time frame for them to get to where they need to be. So. And, and and with the, the the clients that you've got in the the new business that you you, you you're gunning for every year, um, you've got quite a quite an intimate. So it's you sounds like you, people look after about sixty to uh, eighty family units or, or yes. each. That's right, correct. What what's your what would be you know you're the you're the MD of this uh, of managing director of this business. What's your aspiration as far as the numbers of 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 these uh, family groups that can be looked after by an AR. Oh, look! It'd be an awesome experience and an outcome for an individual advisor to be able to expand the number of relationships that they can look after. To you know, I've heard anecdotally with the use of technology and the way AI is heading, you know, you're talking numbers of two and three hundred relationships that an advisor could look after. That's a lot. That's a long way from seventy or eighty. Oh, that's huge. And I think about that constantly. And while that's something to aspire to as a as a business and a business owner. I know how complicated life is these days and the level of detail that our guys go to in their involvement, rightly or wrongly, with, with clients that you've got to be a superhuman being to be across two or 300 people at any one time because you know unless they're the same type of cohort of clients and they're all experiencing the same thing, life's not linear. It's multidimensional. Life's not linear, one of my favorite sayings. And, you know, you, you know somewhere in that two or 300, someone's having a divorce, someone's died. Yep. Someone's had a business struggle, someone's had a fight, they're not talking to their family. Life gets in the way yep. and advisors are in a very, very unique position to become trusted confidence. If you had 300 people come to you with 300 unique problems, there's no way you could do that by yourself. Obviously, you've got teams of people around you, but if you're the smartest person in the room- It's a lot, a lot of emotional It's, it's a lot of emotional. Yeah. So you know, we're, we're testing the boundaries there though, Andrew. We're saying, okay- how many can we go to? But is that so? Can I ask you? Do your ARs are they supported in teams, or do you have a central? So maybe give it a, a bit of a, a feel to the yeah, listeners of how how your sure. ARs are supported. Yeah, so so they're supported by teams. Uh, there's there's pods of people in an office where you've got you know obviously PA uh, support, making meetings and mm-hmm. those sorts of things, and then you've got the uh, implementation and, and admin teams, advisor admins. So. You know, helping them prepare for meetings and and um, conducting research. So they're doing your review packs, your review yep. packs, and they're they're doing their their comparisons and yep. analysis, uh, and getting an advisor and keeping an advisor in their space, which we've talked about for our clients. We're keeping the clients concentrated on their their A game. Well, we want our advisors on their A game, so we have teams of people around them to support them as best as we possibly can. And you kicked off uh, part of your career as a as in power planning, uh, contracting effectively to a bunch of things. How do you do your power planning? Is it in house, out house? No, that's all outsourced. Okay, all our power planning is outsourced, and we learned this a long time ago. That, and I started as a power planner. Yeah, and and it was a great learning ground for me to learn my trade. Like we're one of the very few industries that you can go to university and do your post grad and apply it, apply your knowledge day one. It, it's applicable in what we do. Um, so I did my background in 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 power planning and we want our guys to understand and learn the nuances of strategy but I we don't want them sitting there entering data into a machine and becoming yeah. glorified typists you know well full respect to your contract power planners there uh <laughs> no no they no. so this is where we've gone that's there right people who specialize that's right and they're good at it they're good at it so let them be good at yeah. what they do and let's use them to help us and for our guys, we're going to, they're still going to learn that by yep. observation and osmosis and being involved in the process with their advisor, but they get to come to meetings. Well, you're getting the right people doing the right things at the right time. Absolutely. Right? So, so um, and uh, you, you mentioned earlier that you've, you've self licensed, you got a license in 2005 and, and fiercely independent. And a part of that was the, I suppose, the whole interaction with accountants from day one, which mm. was, Always, always funny, you know. I think even um, back in the day, as an advisor, you always felt like you were 
acting um, for the client in front of you. But the legalities of being a tight agent or, or under the insurance was you, you weren't. No. So it was it was conflicted from day one. I'm glad it's changed. Um, and um, yeah, the, the ownership of a structure of your business, uh, 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 is it the private equity? Is it privately owned? Is it, It's all you know? privately owned. So uh, each of those businesses, so uh, financial planning, accounting, uh, so will all have equity interests. So yeah, the, the genesis of a Brisbane office is the guy who owns, half owns the Brisbane, not Brisbane office, Darren, worked with us in the city and said, oh, I don't want to live here anymore. I want to move back to Queensland. So- Darren Morris. Darren yeah. Morris. Yeah. Open up a uh, open up a Brisbane office. Uh, Newcastle, Brad Ferguson yep. says, I don't want to live here anymore. And he's been with you for ages. 20 Brad. years, 20 years yeah. this year. Yeah, Brad. Yeah, shout out to Brad. Yeah, that's a, that's a big achievement since 2004. And he came to the city as well, brought his little family down and, and lived at uh, Rod Point and traveled in every day, public transport, that then eventually goes, you know, all my family and my wife's family are in Newcastle and move home. So we do the same thing. So you've got uh, each one of the disciplines and each one of the regions have the ability to have different shareholding, depending Correct. on who's driving the, the, the business. Is that right? That's exactly With right. the overall Bell Group, which I believe Anthony's the, the, the head of, yep. sort of sits across, gives you mentorship, assists you with ca- capital, uh, those sorts of things, I imagine. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Brand recognition. Yep. Uh, IP, uh, business IP, knowledge. Yep. Uh, and the the other one, mate, is is also access to people or resource. And what I mean by that is, well, we we're, the black book that we have access to is quite valuable. And when you're a part of the family, you're it sounds quite mafia like. When you're a part of the family, you're a part of the family. Just drop the bike. Yeah, and you get access to our black book. It doesn't matter where you are. Yeah. It's been Newcastle, Sydney, Tamworth. It's you've got access to all of the resources of the Bell Partners brand that we can bring to bear to help anyone in our business succeed if that's their mission. And you're still expanding? Absolutely. So, look, we might, we'll touch on that towards the end when, when I sort of ask you for, you for your state of play, but, but from, from the get-go, if, if, uh, what are the attributes of the sort of person that you look for who could run a geographical business for you? Mm. Aspirational is certainly one of those aspects. Uh, and how do you define that, Brett? How do you define aspirational? There are... Certain type, I, I, you know, again through relationships and, and conversations and getting to understand and know people. Um, always asking someone, you know, what's your mission? What do you, what are you, where are you trying to land with this? What's, what's your end game here? What's your aim? You know, you bang on, mate. Before we started on this piece of paper, you wrote, "What's your mission, rocks today?" Yeah, and he wrote, "Ensemble's mission." And I, I said, "The positive evolution of financial advice." You underlined it. You said, "Good," and I feel like that's how you conduct a lot of your interviews. <laughs> you need to have. <laughs> Yes, Bruce. <laughs> yeah, it, it's like an end. <laughs> there needs to be a absolutely an end in sight. Like we're doing this for some particular type of reason. Correct. We want to understand that intimately in detail uh, with the people that we're we're potentially going into business with. Why are you here? You know, what are you trying? What is it that you're trying to achieve? And they go, Well, Brett, what are you trying to achieve? And I go, My one word mission statements win. Yeah, I just want to win. They go, What does that mean? I go, I, I, Sometimes I don't know, but I go, I know I want today to be better than yesterday. Yeah, and tomorrow to be better than today, and you know, in our businesses, you can create your own scorebook. Yeah, and and you really, you because you don't have like in financial service, you don't have a plant and equipment. You don't have to run out and buy a fifteen million dollar piece of kit to earn five hundred thousand. You just use your imagination, your brain, your hard work, and your skills, right? So, it's a pretty privileged position. Now, speaking of of of, of infrastructure and whatnot, um. Maybe what's what's your tech stack? Because it's effectively our plan and equipment. Yeah, isn't it? absolutely. That's a really good question. We had an innovation day at an AFSL level two weeks ago in Sydney, uh, and that was again born out at the start of the year. Uh, being our own AFSL and being involved with big AFSLs, you'd go to PD days, and a PD day would cover technical, personal development, professional development, tech. It'd be all crammed in, and you'd have five hundred people there, uh, and. A lot of the time, maybe it's tick a box. You'd say, oh, like, I want to take one thing away from that. And we run PD days, uh, absolutely. So, you know, two PD days a year where we do a lot of technical research. But those areas where we were doing days where it was on personal development and high performance aspect where we might carve out two or four hours, I said, there's something in this. We need to do more about that. So we picked up that high performance piece and moved it to its own two-day event. Great. And then the innovation and the tech which was also a part of a PD day, I go, there's something in this as well because it's evolved so quickly and some of our young guys are using technology that just blows my mind and makes my head spin. 
there's got to be something in that. So we carved out a whole day two days ago where we, where are we? Where's this industry going? Where are we trying to land? And what are the technology pieces that we can use to help get there? And no disrespect to the financial planning software community, I think they'd be finding it very, very hard um, because you know what are our important pieces of technology that we use? And your overall group, you've got accounting, you've got debt, you've got so. This, this. You're looking at a bunch of different ones as well, right? You are. So, you know, the, the, the magic one is, you know, you know, there are legalities around it is, is databases and CRM shared information is, is a big part trying to, to master that. Uh, and that's also for succession. If a planner decides to leave, the person who comes in can kick off with a running start yep. and they've got access to information really quickly. The other one is, is the utilization of AI to help in meetings. So, you know, I'm a lot of it when it comes to technology and one of the young guys goes, this is how I run my meetings because we do a Teams and this thing called Fireflies, it keeps showing up. I go, who's Fireflies? He goes, Brett, that's the bot in the back that's listening to what we're saying and it's summarizing everything into a meeting note. And I go, so you don't, we don't write notes anymore? He goes, no. And we were doing Teams meetings. So I, I noticed your bell part, the pens have a lot of ink in them. Yeah, they don't. <laughs> so I go to meetings now and I take my computer and it's through Teams. Or so this is Firefly you guys use because some people use Copilot. There's, there's a few other ones out there. As yeah. an AFSL, yeah, yeah. it's ubiquitous. Yeah. I don't care. Yeah. As long as we follow the process of where that information is stored and held yeah. to, to follow compliance yeah. rules. So some – and we're trolling them. Copilot is, is yeah. kicked off. Fireflies. I go to meetings and I'll take Zoom and I'll just turn the Zoom on yeah. and record the meeting, let people know you're being recorded. And at the end of the meeting, it's spookily accurate. What it's telling, and I and that would save. Is that is that that's a technical term? Spook Sp- spookily accurately accurate. <laughs> to to go, I can't believe how much time I'm getting back. Yeah, it's unreal. Oh. And, and and so, but um, as far as production of uh, your plans, are you do that's, that's are you guided by the the, the outsourced power planning business? Or, it's or? midwinter, so we get midwinter software to to support that for calculators, risk research. Yep. We're constantly exploring ways how we can. Uh, democratize the use of technology. So if there's the world's best risk researcher and yep. let's use that yep. and the world's best calculators, let's use that and the world's best – we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. That's just – I don't get that why financial planners would do that. Well, it costs a lot of money too. It costs right? a lot of money and things are moving so rapidly because we've got a mission we want to reach yep. and these guys want to make and help as many clients as they possibly can. So if we can take their meeting note time away and give them four hours – or 10 hours in a week to do that and put time back in their day so they can use that more efficiently, Yep. then we work on a not-to-do list. Let's take away as many tasks as we can. Not-to-do list. Love it. Um, and uh, you, you, you inferenced insurance there, and, and it's been um, it's been well-documented. Insurance has been pretty hard to, to roll out um, in the last sort of four or five years. With so many of your clients being self-employed, do you, do you have a large life insurance um, business? There is, yeah. We had the statistics the other day and, um, and again, because it's not something I watch every day. You might look at it every year and, and it's I, I don't know what big ones are, but I was surprised at the statistics of how big- The enforced premium the enforced or whatnot. premium is. Yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. And for those aspirational clients who are in the accumulation phase, who use debt, who've got investment properties or they've got businesses with key person risk insurance is, a, yep. is very efficient. So. And do you have a specialist who does that or it's sort of um, no, it's yeah, all, all shoulders to the wheel? All shoulders to the wheel. Okay. You know, some guys will go, it's not my go-to and they'll partner up with someone else who goes, I love Internally? This. Internally, yeah. 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 Um, but most guys will go, this is a valuable part of the proposition I'm putting forward uh, and clients need it, so I have to be good at it. And everyone um, – Oh, and, and sorry, before I do that, is there any um, – so although this is a, a, a podcast that's about practice management, it would be remiss if, if uh, we didn't acknowledge some of the, the platforms or some of the people around. Is there any, any people that yeah. have helped the Bell Partners out there to give them a shout out? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, like we help people keep their eyes on the prize and focus on the main game, we need to stay focused on the main game. Post-GFC, we were taught a lot of lessons. Before GFC, we ran investment committee meetings, we ran asset allocation committee meetings, and that's overriding the research that was being done by Van Eyck, uh, who were the research providers for charter financial planning. So they'd have asset allocation guides, they'd have investment portfolio selection, and we thought we were smarter than those guys, and we'd go and carve out huge amounts of time to try and do a better job. GFC taught us a lesson that uh, invariably a lot of advisors, if not all advisors here in Australia, 
you don't beat the market, you join the market. So we well, you, learned, you add value in other ways. Right? You, <laughs> you add value in other ways. Uh, we learned that transparency and pricing is everything and the ability to transact. So we ended up in a situation where we go, oh, we, we need to pick a path here. Are we asset managers or asset gatherers? We can't be both. So we've chosen. Asset managers or asset gatherers. Correct. Uh, you've got some great one line. <laughs> I'd like to, I'd like to hold that I've come up, <laughs> I came up with these. Uh, but I'll let everyone in on a little secret. If you want to learn to be the best in financial planning, go to America. Uh, we've done numerous tours and paid our own way to go at FPA conferences, and that's where all the smartest people. We always come back with great ideas to say, let's repeat what they're doing technology stack wise. It's difficult because our market is so unique, and the, yep. the Americans just can't get their head around it. And we're so small. But from a practice point of view, they're, 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 some of the things they do are, are awesome. And we saw this seven or eight years ago. You have to pick a stream. Gathering or management, you can't be both these days. Yeah. If you are management, you need a dedicated team in your business who are doing this all day, every day. And I suspect that they are very, very expensive. And the fee compression in asset management is getting harder and harder. You're yeah. not going to make any money. So we so, said, so Bells as a group have gone the other way. We've gone the other way. So we, we've gone, okay, well, we're gathering who we're using in management. And we worked with BlackRock in 2013, 14. Uh, because we've gone, our lessons show us can't beat the market, join the market. So we need passive techniques or passive access to markets with active asset allocation. We need low cost. So we need ETFs and they're transparent and physical ownership. Uh, and we need the ability for someone else to push the button so we could avoid fat fingers and we don't have to draw checks if someone makes a mistake. Yep. So we packaged all that up together and uh, it was separately managed accounts or individually managed accounts using ETFs. You were doing them years ago. I remember years. bumping into you and you sort of were, sort of said, Rox, what are you doing in your business? And, you, and I'm like, that sounds like a bloody good idea. It's It, it was um, State Street had a had a version of it um, and BlackRock put a very compelling case to, together for us and we said, all right, well, we're happy to back with the world's biggest asset manager. If, if you can't get it right, nobody can. And we partnered, like they run all the portfolios for us mm-hmm. via um, – a couple of platforms, you know, again, platforms in this in this industry, you end up over 30 years, you can end up with stuff everywhere. Yep. And we're under a project at the moment to consolidate that down. To- Do you have any Navigator left, bro? Uh, no. <laughs> no, Navigator. Asgard. You know, you'll pick that up yep. as you go by with clients picking up legacy stuff. You'll, you'll, you'll come across it. The thing I've noticed, though, is, and some practices might resonate this who've been around for a long, long time, is you're bringing young guys through and you want to, you, you, you've got to teach them about the business and you say, here's the products. And they, they look at you like D's in the headlight. You go, you've got to know North, you've got to know yeah. Hub, BT, Net Wealth. You rattle off five or six and it can't be done because they all have their own uniqueness and they all have their own different ways of doing things via technology. And we've learned the hard way is these young, young guys coming through are asked to do very difficult tasks across multiple platforms and mistakes occur. And when they do, guess who ends up paying for them? The business. So we've gone, we can't have this anymore. We've got to go from six platforms to at most two. Yeah. We've got to get to this And you're point. in the process of making We're that decision. We're in the process of making that decision to go, we've got to land on two. And, and your request for information process where you're, you're doing your due diligence, um, is you're trying to understand where are they trying to land? Where are they going to be in five or 10 years? Because yeah. having 25, 30 years like you and I have, a lot of these platforms come in and talk a good game and have talked a good game, and then in five years' time, they've underinvested. Someone else has come in, schooled them on experience and service and, and technology, and your tech stack, your providers are starting to become a problem for it's you. It's Groundhog Day. And it's Groundhog Day. And changing platforms is like sticking a spoke in the wheels of a bike. It will stop your business overnight. Changing licenses, changing software, or changing platforms are business stoppers. And you, and for us, you go, we don't want to have to do this unless it's completely necessary. And licensee, we don't have to change because it's ours. But the other two- I see your complaints department. It's just a little box on your desk. And correct. And you've locked it. I've locked it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> complaints department is closed. It, it's like, you know, you don't want to have to do those and correct. take your focus away. So we're in that project. Yeah, jumping around is is-, oh. is and look, the other facet of it is, is that because you've got, and we're going to talk about the people, sort of the people, and and you know what what the I suppose it's a multi pronged culture in the Bell Group, to be honest, because yeah. of the different geographies. Um, the um, 
the fact that you've got ownership and people have got a, a share in the game at various levels with various things means that that you are getting a lot of people putting their shoulder to the wheel and things like uh, chasing rainbows. You, when you do your executive meetings, you can sort of rule them out and say, "Well, no, this is this is our plan." Now, Matt, um, the question I like to do, to ask is why people join you. Yep. Um, why they stay and and how do they grow? So from a uh, we've kind of touched on this earlier as far as you know you want to recruit people who are very aspirational yeah. and and their backgrounds are irrelevant. It's got to do with how they conduct themselves and their aspirations. So you're kind of I've kind of got that one, but maybe a few other questions. So um, uh, are you guys um, in all your offices? Are you are you work from office? Are you hybrid? What, what's what's it like to work here? It's um, fundamentally at the end of the day, as long as you get your job done and you're a responsible adult, I don't really have an issue where you where you work from. Having an office is a challenge for the business owner. And we've talked about this a lot, particularly in big cities, they struggle with the work from, because it's so far for them to travel. It's easier to stay home and maybe do Pilates and walk the dog than it is to come in and do a day's work. Now, everyone who works in Bell Group, Brett's not, Brett's not a, a saying you, 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 no. you, you're doing Pilates all day. but no, uh... it's a generalization, a generalization. <laughs> But we've talked about that at a, at a company level to go, this isn't a them issue. This is an us issue. Yeah. If people aren't coming into work as often as we can- You haven't earned the commute. We haven't earned the commute. Yeah. We haven't given them the excitement to go, I yeah. cannot wait to come into the office today to see <coughs> what could happen. Now, what happens now, Brett, is because I'm coughing. Remember we said at the beginning that we stopped? Yeah. This is it. <laughs> uh, we're not going to. I'm not going to edit that out. I'm just going to keep rolling. Keep so, rolling. So that's an us issue, not a them issue. So- Look, I, I'm, I'm open to say, if you want to work from home, work from home. We'd love you to work here. And it's a challenge on the business to make sure we're creating an environment that our guys want to come in because they're learning, they're having fun, they're participating, they're helping build a culture, they're, they're, they're training, they're educating, uh, they're getting knowledge, they're, they're, they're observing, they get to come to meetings, those sorts of things. So so what's, when you talk about meetings, because I, I, um, earlier I, I met your um, yeah, your GM or, or, or yep. your PM, um Top bloke, and um, and I sort of was very keen on what your meeting rhythms are. So, as the overall group, because you've got businesses within business, you've got the Tamworth business here, you've got a, your financial planning. Sort of, what's a, what's the daily or the weekly rhythms for your meetings? Just so help people out. Yeah, sure. Uh, so you'll find there'll be at least half a day a week we'll carve out for internals. And Jabba. Specific day? Yeah, Mondays, half day Mondays yep. are for all the internal meetings. So you'll find that each office will have their firm wide meeting where they where they collaborate as a group, all divisions yep. in the office, Monday mornings to go, okay, guys, what's the week holding? What are the burning issues? So that, that's week? an office one that's and that cascades up? And that will cascade up on occasions to firm wide where we'll do Zooms and everyone dials in yep. and, and Ant will put forward yep. plus conferences and those sorts of things. Then interdivisionally, interdiv- where we'll have our wealth team. So that's di- like that's discipline based. So discipline the base wealth. Yep. Giving, yep. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, we will connect as, as advisors once a fortnight, where we'll carve out a little bit of time to go right. What were we trying to achieve? Where are we at? Yep. What needs to occur? And then with the admin guys, same sort of thing. Every fortnight to connect as a group to go. What's actually because they're the source of truth a lot of the time. The admin team. Yep. Because they're punching the workout that's happening at an advice level, and we've had it in situations in the past. I'll be brutally honest. We've had people in our business who've just flat out lied as as advisors. Uh, I don't think maliciously. I think it's people do funny things under pressure when there's expectations and results that need to be achieved, and and they're not being achieved. People will flat out lie to you. And I'm an I'm a not gullible, but I, I take people at face value. If they say they're going to do something, like here in the country, a friend said to me, and here in the country, if you if you say you do something, you do it, you do it. Otherwise, you might get punched in the face. So you, the city is a very different beast. And um, so I'm, I take people at face value. And and learning that they say one thing and do another is very disheartening. So I learn very quickly that the admin team who are supporting the advisors are the source of truth. Right. So they sit there and go, "I've got meetings A, B, and C this week." So I just go and ask them. They go, "Is that true?" No. And they go, well, mate, you're lying. So I make sure that as a group, we're meeting with our admin guys on a regular basis to confirm. So that's the weekly meeting. Yeah, that's yep. the week. I'm, I'm, as an admin team, I like yep. no advisors. It's a, a, so separated. Separated. Because quite often, because of, I suppose, the different sorts of personality traits, quite often if you put a, a, a bunch of ARs and a bunch of operations, the operations feel a bit minimized. They don't speak up. Absolutely. They won't speak up. Uh, and they feel less than, and I want to give them a voice because it's an important voice, and they 
will tell yeah. they'll tell the truth and I want to be able to to hold people to account if they're saying one thing and doing the other. I don't want to do that. I, I again I take people at face value and if you say you're going to do something you do it. And- well, well every 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 football team needs you only succeed if your back offers, your physios, your strappers, the people who organize it, you know that that that's that's uh, the story of the world no matter which which organization you're in and can I ask how do you reward those team members, because you, you said something earlier about, you know, your advisors have the ability to earn what they want. Absolutely. Do you have like, any kind of in- incentive program for the overall group? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there are targets that, that we're aiming to achieve. For the admin team as well? Everybody. Awesome. So when we have revenue targets and we exceed those revenue targets, there's a bonus pool for everybody to share in. Awesome. And is that what, an annual thing? Or, it's an annual, they, yeah, yeah, it's an annual thing. Uh, so we, you know. So I'm, I'm working in, in your, like, uh, as a, a, a in client administration. Yep. A company hits a target, and then my division hits a target. And you've got an equation, and I get some take-home pay. You get some take-home pay. Yeah, oh, happy days. And we'll have sprints too as you get closer to the financial year. Yeah. Uh, and we'll have sprints that you go. We've got to be able to produce this amount of work. Everyone gets paid in the one day, and this is what everyone gets. Yeah, we so get this. It's be quite a party. Can be. Yeah. yeah, can be. Can be. Okay, so if you're listening and uh, you work in the Bell Group, uh, we've we've now got uh, uh, it's now September. You've got uh, nine months. So, nine months. So uh, if you want it to be a party, you know what to do. Absolutely. Uh, it, it, so there, there, there's times through the year where we'll go. Okay, there's the opportunity to push here. Let's yep. push, and we hit this. There's something in it for everybody, and, and we want we want to we want. As I said, my my one word my, my one word mission statement is I want to win. These guys want to win. Yep. The best way that they can win is by how much money did I have put into my bank? And and do your overall team because they are you know scattered geographically. Yep. You, you come together for a physical conference every year. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. we had uh, we have two PD days. That's that's advice and, and admin support. They're face to face. That's face to face. Yeah. And then uh, we had our high performance gathering, which was everybody in the company came together for two days, where we brought in uh, special forces soldiers. NRL coaches, uh, we've had uh, international cricketers come and present to us, psychologists come and present to us. Uh, we even have um, guys who'll come and talk to us about uh, subconscious programming and, and manifestation to be able to give everybody in the audience or in our company the tools to generate success. And, and is that so? That's just happened. That happens at the beginning of your. That was in May. Yes, your financial year. Or do you guys do? Um, uh, so your years are calendar years or, or financial years? Uh, it's both. I'm, you know, we're measuring results calendar year and financial year, but typically financial year. Yeah, yeah. Do yeah. your um, you do your results, but calendar year is when we'll do our meeting cycles. So we do our PD day. That professional high performance day was in well, all two days was in May. Uh, PD days every six months, and the innovation day was was only recently. So. Look, and I see that um, on your website here, you've got a high performance mental skill coaching as one of the pillars. Of what you can offer your clientele, correct? absolutely. Okay, so it's something you, you you practice what you preach. Absolutely, and we're in a very fortunate position of dealing with some clients who operate at the highest level they possibly can yep. globally, and being students of high performance, where we're constantly asking questions and learning lessons from those people, and then incorporating them not into what only what we do, but to pass that knowledge and information on to our guys, but but clients. And listening to you today, you, you've referenced the, the fact you, 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 your winning is, is very important to you, and that's no doubt shared with your fellow directors. But uh, I suppose an often overlooked um, facet of, of high-performance people is, is your willingness and ability to give back. Um, uh, from memory, uh, you guys support a charity. In fact, you've got your own foundation, the Loyalty Foundation, which was set up 15 years ago. Correct. Maybe give us a feel of, of what that is and, and how your team members um, can be part of that. Okay. So that Loyal Foundation, as you said, was set up 15 years ago uh, and the and the, the way it was was formed, how it was, was born out was uh, everybody might, not everybody, but a lot of people might remember that they would go, you would go to a charity event and they'd auction off some rugby jerseys or a rugby league jersey or a cricket bat, those sorts of things and, and Anthony... Uh, came up with the idea he goes look these aren't they're not shifting the needle on a lot of these aspects you know yep. people are tired we need to try and do something differently uh, and came up with with sailing yep. and getting a bunch of people together to sail and it had to be for a cause and that was for the loyal cause uh the first the first time that it occurred uh all of the sailors had their own charity and we raised money and that money was then divided amongst the charities uh, some had helped. Some said, "This isn't. This will make a small, small difference. We want to shift the needle again." Uh, so it went into buying medical equipment for children, the Humpty Dumpty Foundation. 
So uh, it supports other other charities and other worthy causes, but the primary one is to buy medical equipment for kids. Well, I'm reading your website, and this is a, a, a testament to Anthony, um, yourself, and, and, and the whole team and vision, and I'm sure there's lots of people behind the scenes who made it work. The Loyal, Lo- this Loyal Foundation has raised over $6 million for charity and purchased over 400 pieces of life-saving medical equipment in over 100 hospitals across Australia. So what that says to me is that that you can win in this as well. Absolutely. And that was a very strong mission. We're also very proud of the fact that there is no admin costs other than compliance that's required to run a foundation, but there are, there are no costs, there's no wages, there's nothing. The, 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 the company and the people within the company put this foundation together. and So that's how your team, that's how you, 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 your, your coalface team can give back is – is um, amongst other things, um, you know, they may not be the wealthiest people, but if they can, if they can do their bit, then that's a, that's a big absolutely yeah. In any yeah. any any event or activity that we have, you know, it could come down to selling raffle tickets to yeah. raise money for raffle prizes, but for raising money to to help buy equipment. You're talking, you know, it's bought half million dollar ambulances before. Yeah, and look, I'd be remiss of me now. For those of you who don't know, um, that little sailing boat they put together actually won the city to Hobart, right? So, yeah, twice. so twice. So, um, you know, yet again, that win comes into the, the Lexian. So, absolutely. Um, uh, I'm sure all the sailors out there that knew that. So, Brett, um, uh, you've got you've got a lot going on. What's your? Can I ask a question? Because this this podcast is about the engine room of how businesses are put together. So, your business is is similar in many aspects to to um, some businesses, but but also very dissimilar in the way in which you're putting it together. What's your vision for the future for financial planners and the way in which they'll deliver advice given you, you know, you've been doing it for a little while? Yeah, sure. My vision is actually there's nothing new in what we're doing. I reckon a lot of the things we are evolving to and moving towards have already been done. And what I'm talking and, and what I'm talking about there is, you know, it's almost like going back to the nineties eighties and nineties with the insurance. And not that I advocate, you know, you said tight agency were always conflicted. Some of those features and functionalities of that time. Peace of mind. It all makes sense, doesn't it? Advisors would go out with something called a car, client advice record. Yep. They'd sit and have a meeting and go, Andrew, what are your issues? This, that, and the other. And they go, I recommend this. No different to going to a doctor. He says, you've got a cough. I've run some tests. You have the flu. Here is my prescription of how to get better. After 25 or 30 years, you can walk into a meeting, ask several sorts of questions. You could diagnose fairly quickly what's going on have the solutions available to people and go, here it is. Clients don't want 80 page reports, they want the answer. And so so but you're advocating uh, you know some deregulation, but I know you personally, you you are massively behind extreme professionalism in financial absolutely. advice. So so what's the what if you had a wand, what would you do? I I'm not uh, not advocating for deregulation. I'm advocating for and, and it is moving towards simplicity. You go. Know, there are people who go. I just need help. With this particular issue, I can solve that particular issue. Yep. You know, here's the solution. Here's the price. When you need me, come back. So ultra, like more like a Medicaid, ultra transparency. Ultra transparency, absolutely. Yep. And, and a tech stack behind us that allows us to be able to knock that on the head straight away and not be buried in paperwork or admin for hours and hours and hours after. Not to say we're not taking notes, but. Seeing how AI is able to help with meeting notes, have a have a phone have a recording phone call meeting, have it all recorded, and you've said I recommend you do A, B, C, and D. Here's my advice. Here it is in writing to back up what I've told you, but it's being delivered to you within minutes. Within minutes, you know. So people aren't paying you for the eighty page report. People are paying you for you, Andrew. Of course they are. They always were. You know. Always and, were. And um um. Uh, so simplicity, I think technology is probably going to save us faster than oh, regulation. Absolutely. So, um, and what about the way? I mean, you're a multi-discipline practice, and and you're you're here in in Northwest New South Wales. Mm-hmm. Um, there's lots of lots of really uh, impressive people are working in this office. Um, is is Bell uh, in the market to to attract new advisors to to work with you, and or um. The genesis of this particular branch was that you you did a joint venture. Correct. Um, if you're a financial planner and AR out there in 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 regional um, northeast New South Wales, who loves planning, loves the clients, but may not be enamoured with all the other stuff, would are you are you still on the lookout to bring in business partners? Absolutely, absolutely. Business, particularly when I when I talk about our businesses, can be very very isolated. 
It's lonely sometimes. It is very, very lonely. And and you might be a part of a big I was a part of a big licensee. Twelve hundred people were in charter. And you go to PD days and some days I felt like the only person on the face of the earth. I knew nobody. And there were friendly people and I did meet some great people who were very very helpful and very instrumental and impactful on my career. Uh, but I can imagine and empathize what it's like to go to those big dealer group sessions and be lonely or even smaller ones, you know, you go- The whole reason why Ensemble, part of the reason they exist is that that you're right, it, even though you're the most important person in your client's life, it, it is still small business. It's small business. It's isolated. It's lonely. And if, you know, a, a part of our preposi- proposition is say, why would people want to join what your cause? They, they're not joining Bell Partners brand alone. They're joining a cause. They're joining a mission. They're joining a vision. And my, my response back to them is, you know, it's lonely. You're, you're being a part, you're joining a part of a community of like-minded people who all see the same thing and they all believe in the same thing and they're all heading in the same direction. So you've got a community, you've got a cohort, you've got connection, Yep. you've got meaning, you've got a purpose, you know, you, you can make an impact, you can shift the dial, not only in your location, but across the entire group. And you might be in business for yourself, but you're not in business by yourself. And the guy- Another one of those great lines. Kieran, we're going to have to just, I think we'll have to have a separate uh, uh, great lines. Life's not linear, for yourself, asset gatherers. That's it. You're killing it. It's, but they're, they're, they're things that I resonate and with. And you're passionate about it. Absolutely. Because you, know? you, know, you sit here and you go, and I, and then this is anything in life where you say, I'm, I must be the only person who's going through this, when in fact you're not. And when you reach out or, or or you start to see like your ensemble, there is a community out there. And I'm I'm not uh, telling anyone anything that they haven't already experienced or that they already know uh, or can't get access to. It's having the ability to go first to recognize, A, there is a problem, B, what is the, the problem, and being aware of it. Once you're aware of it, you, you typically find the solution, and there's a whole industry of people out there, particularly with the pro- the product providers and the and the platforms and the tech stack people, the vendors, who will either know the solution or they'll know the people who you need to know to provide you. Yeah, the best ones are great connectors. There's no doubt. Oh, absolutely. And and once you're connected with like minded people, yeah, the rest becomes really really easy. So when they say, "Why do I join you?" You're joining a part of a community that stands for something and wants to achieve something. Yeah, and you're not alone. You're actually in business for yourself, not by yourself, uh, and we're starting to learn how to build that connectivity even better and, and deeper, and technology has been so fantastic for that. Um, WhatsApp groups or Signal groups and Teams and Zooms and, you know, it's it's easy. I, I haven't gone down the path of Snapchat yet. Uh, if I want to communicate, I've got two teenage kids. If I send them the text. Mate, if you go on the platforms they're on, they'll disown you. If I send a text, I do not get an answer. If I send a WhatsApp, I do not get an answer. If I ring, they may pick up the phone. And I had this happen here with with one of our uh, colleagues in the accounting team to send her a, a client who's a young fellow, a tradesperson, gone out in business for himself. She said, I've sent an email to him. I haven't heard back from him. Don't send him an email. They're not gonna. They're not gonna read it. I said, send him a. You on Snapchat? She yeah. Goes, yes. I said, send him a Snapchat. Three seconds. Bay. Wow. The answer was back, and all she said was, check your email. He went, okay, and checked his email. So the ways we have to communicate now are very, very different. I haven't gone down the path of Snapchat yet, and and I'm loath to do so. And they've got it's it's client preferences, right? So absolutely. And uh, I often think I should just send my kids an Uber Eats and and make the person at the door say, call your mum and dad. Correct. <laughs> and I was sort of bizarre when you're texting your kids or in the next room to say, come out for dinner, but that's the way the world's moved to. And you've got to be able to adapt and change. And I'm talking the interco- interconnectivity between our groups where we've, our, our, the youngest person in our team will be 18. Yep. The oldest is me. At, or, no, our Port Macquarie fellow is a bit older than me. I won't say my age. So they commun- they, they, their lives are very different to ours. So we've got to be able to transcend that and communicate and find those common ways that we can all get on the same page. Absolutely. And and look, Brett, thanks for sharing um, uh, your story. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I, I did know you way before all of this, and I'm, I'm pretty sure neither of us knew what financial planning was when we attended that first degree. And for, for those of you taking notes, I also got two Ps and two Fs <laughs> in the first year of university. So there is, uh, there is uh, and uh, um, I returned home and chipped weeds out of cotton for $8 an hour. So um I very quickly went back and got changed those, changed those Fs into Bs. Absolutely. So, um, look, thanks for being part of the engine room. Pleasure. Thanks for, for you, you know, your words of wisdom. 
Um, and on behalf of your team, you know, you, you've you've crafted something up here at Tamworth that literally didn't exist that they're, they're doing. And I'm, I'm, whether or not they tell you or Snapchat you every day, I'm sure that that's the way they feel. And it'd um, uh, be great. Good to chat again um, uh, and hear about more of these wins. Anytime. So thanks very much, Britt, for being part of the engine room. Pleasure, buddy. 